And we're back for part two, uh, talking about post-structural uh, post textual analysis, and that is deconstruction. So when, when we look then, for example, as we're talking, when we look at, at a piece of writing, which now writing is a more thoughtful activity typically than speaking, and speaking can be largely non-conscious generation of word choice. Uh, so can writing if we're writing casually, but most of the time if we're writing for some purpose, then we place some conscious thought into what we're doing. At least we should, and your teachers will appreciate it if you do. Right? So, uh, but let's look. While a piece of writing is thought to be an expression of the author's self, is the reader any less important? And, and you know that old saying, if a tree falls in the forest and there's no one there to hear it, does it make a sound? And what do you think? Well, the answer, in fact, is no, it doesn't, right? If there's no one here, to, uh, no one there to hear it, it doesn't make a sound. The tree falls, it moves the air in a pattern, and if someone is there to hear it, then their, their eardrum, their tymp tympanic membrane, will transfer that to the cochlea, right, and, and transduce those air impulses, that frequency of vibration, into the experience of sound. If that... If we start from there then, if we look at a piece of writing, is the writing, does it have any meaning if there's no one there to read it? And notice even the author is the reader uh, when they stop writing and, and they look to read what they've written. So this kind of, in a post-structuralist account, says, you know, we, we put all the emphasis on the writer, but is the reader any less important? And we know that readers have vastly different experiences and can interpret what they've read with a drastic difference. So that fascination, that variability in interpretation, right, kind of points at uh, uh, an element of deconstruction, if you will. So meaning is thus potentially in conflict, and whose interpretation is correct? Is it the writer's interpretation of what they were saying, or is it the reader as the, as the recipient? And who was it written for in the first place? Was it the reader or the author? And maybe the author is just writing to get it off their chest. Or maybe the author is writing it to communicate an idea to a reader, and then the reader's interpretation does become all important and all powerful. So uh, the intent is a fictional construct as well, but who, whose intent again? Right? The reader, what am I trying to get out of this? Or the author, what am I trying to communicate in this? But notice both are going on. Uh, and perhaps almost, well not simultaneously, but both going on. So a variety of perspectives is required to, to create a multifaceted interpretation of text. That is, there's not one way to interpret a text. There's multiple ways, perhaps as many as there are readers. Of course, that's kind of pushing it maybe a little too far. So what can we do? We can use language. We can use the written word to then uh, point us in a direction towards what structure produced this conversation, what structure produced this type of writing. And if a different structure was imposed on it, or if a different structure was used to interpret it, will it mean the same thing? Hence, structure matters. Okay. So, Let us then move on to affect theory, because it's kind of an extension of this idea, if you will. So the, what we have then is the post-structuralist response to counter the reductionist explorations of emotion. And what we've studied throughout this course is trying to reduce emotion. What caused the emotion? Uh, what facial expressions are associated with the emotion? What are the action tendencies associated with the emotion? Do we want to classify this emotion as approach or avoid, or if we're using a different structure, uh, then I don't want to use approach and avoid, I want to use negative versus positive. Uh, what do people in a sad mood tend to do that's different than people in a happy mood? Right? These, these are all reductionist ideas that is trying to take emotion, the, the big emotion, and tear it down into its little component parts based on the structure that's been imposed on it and the structure we're coming from and trying to interpret it. So the post-structuralist response is trying to counter this and, and taking a, perhaps a more holistic view. Structuralist accounts tend to bio, biologize emotion experience. I, I didn't get that right and I don't think I'm going to, so let's move on. 
And, and these accounts do so through the limitations of the structure imposed through language. Right? Uh, especially simple, precise, monolithic interpretation. And if we sit in a research meeting filled with psychologists, often most of the meeting is really about defining terms and coming to agreement over uh, how a construct, how an idea, how a theory should be expressed or, or how it's uh, not well expressed. Right? Now, affect theory explains our social experiences in a social world is not exclusively socially determined. That is, in part, it comes from internal and external forces simultaneously. So affect, and now we're going to look at an, another theorist that kind of uh, becomes post-structuralist in this regard. Affect broadly refers to a state of being rather than a, a manifestation or interpretation of emotions. And, and we're coming from Hemings again here. So, and I've alluded to this throughout the course uh, as a place where we were going. And, and it, it, it does kind of coincide with Freudian theory that, that we have this affective stream. And remember Freud said that low levels of, of, of arousal are pleasurable. right? But it's when the affective stream dips, then that signals the need for, uh, it signals a need state and instigates drives, right, to bring the affect back up. Or when we're over aroused, then in fact we seek out ways to diminish that level of arousal to that, that pleasant, right, kind of just above baseline uh, positivity in, in the affect. Affect is the qualitative expression uh, uh, of the quantity of the drive's mental energy. So the, the mental energy, and remember Freud says just a little bit elevated is, is good, then, then the qualitative is the description of the, the positivity, negativity, among other things, of that uh, drive energy. So that's why I like to think in terms of this affective stream, that this is something that if you're alive, the affective stream is running. And it can run high, it can run low, but we want it to be kind of just moderately uh, elevated. So Tompkins is clearly channeling Freud. There's no two ways about it. Advancing the psychoanalytic account of affective experience. But he doesn't want to rely on the simplicity of Freud's drives. And notice that Freud's drives are e extremely structured. So we got Eros, we got Thanatos. We're, we're either, uh, you know, tuned into creation or destruction and notice that's a structure that is, is very confining that Freud imposes on our experience right and, and we see that the, the, it's the dynamicism the, the, the conflict that so uh, drove Freud in his theorization what, what Tompkins is saying is no drives in themselves can be rewarded and drives are, are tied to motivational states and, and that's still a tough one uh, motivation ill-defined drives as a, as a method uh, can, can fall short in, in defining motivation. But what we're talking about then is kind of opening up a bigger picture of, of this state of affect. And as this affect dips, then it instigates drives perhaps, and then drives right are, are tied to motivation to kind of change the state and, and bring the affect up to where it's desired to be. So. Tompkins is, is a hardwired kind of theorist, so, so what, he, what he's looking at is, is this is our biological basis, and notice that we just said that deconstruction often comes back to biology. Biology is an easy structure to impose because it's hard to deny. I mean, we are biological mechanisms, so uh, doesn't that make sense, right? So hardwired affect systems then, these are from uh, present from birth, this, this is our evolutionary legacy, this is the DNA kind of generated uh, consequence, if you will, interest and excitement, okay. enjoyment, joy, surprise, startle, distress, anguish, disgust, contempt, anger, rage, shame, humiliation, and fear and terror. So if we looked and said, well, okay, so what are Tomkin's Tom basic emotions? And, and notice that we have, might have a difficulty here. Uh, basic affective states maybe is another way to get at this. These are likely hardwired according to Tom, Tompkins and they're subject to social vo forces via motivational narratives. And motivational narratives 
It's going to label as scripts. That is the way to do life, right? Remember, behavioral schemas, what can we call a behavioral schema? A script, right? It's a good way to go. So when we're looking at behaviors that are going to be employed in response to the fluctuating affective states, right, the states of being, that then we're looking at them as narratives. What should I do in this circumstance? What have I learned interacting with affective experience? So at this point with Tompkins, we've joined a whole bunch of ideas together. We've got kind of basic emotions. We've got an affective stream, which is qualitative, right? Drives are quantitative. How badly do I want this, the, the drive, right? Or to what extent am I satisfied? And that can be the potency of drive. And then it's expressed through affect or experienced through affect, right? And this then interacts with our behavioral choices, be they non-conscious or conscious choices. So I know it's kind of a lot to digest. Fortunately, this is video, so you can run it backwards. Unfortunately, we're not in a position where we can easily ask questions, but you can do that when we get to uh, our Zoom meetings or, or whenever. So let's then pull in more fully the idea of narratives and scripts. Right? So the narratives and affect systems, scripts then arise and are modified by our ongoing experience. So my affect is fluctuating, as are my drive states. I want to do something about it because I'm a biological being. Then based on the narrative, my description, my understanding, my perception of what is going on around me, then uh, I, I enact these scripts, but the scripts are subject to modification on the basis of the narrative, which is shaped by the current stimuli uh, in which I'm embedded. And, and notice we can kind of go back uh, to thinking about some people we talked about previously in the class who kind of support these ideas. Kurt Lewin is one that pops to mind that we operate within that phenomenal field, uh, our perception of life. So it's not just cultural scripts, but in individual experience that modifies cultural scripts, because obviously everyone in a culture does not operate the same way or perceive their world in the same way. So it can be very idiosyncratic. And, and uh, we can develop, evolve to manage our social experience in potentially very unique ways based on how successful we believe we were. And, and now the behaviors, can come, they can chime in and talk about our reward, punishment, history, and the attitudes people can come in and say, yeah, but what is your perception of uh, a reward or punishment? So it, it bring in together a lot of ideas into a, kind of a, a workable explanation of how we, who we are and how we behave. So like uh, Damasio's somatic markers, past experiences, and remember the somatic markers, things that impact us negatively or positively, the, 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 the recording of reward or punishment, to stimuli, right, that tying of those together, those somatic markers. Past experiences influence one's emotional experience, flavoring subsequent emotional experience and re-experience. So we are, we are learning creatures, we're adaptive creatures, and based on our experiences, rewards, punishments, etc., how they interact with our emotional states, then, then influence our choices in the future. So then the results of Tompkins' FX system then, determinism diminishes an, as an explanation for emotional experience. We're going to set determinism aside. Right? Uh, free will becomes possible to a greater degree right? because it can be very idiosyncratic and it's shaped along our experiences. Now this gets to an issue of free will that can free will be somewhat individualized on the basis of non-conscious selection I mean, that's, that's really kind of a heady topic. Maybe we don't need to go there. But free will becomes possible to a greater degree in this regard. And affective contagion, then, that we've discussed, uh, you know, several different ways, right, uh, can be viewed in yet another way. It's, it's the narration of, of our inner life. So we, we move through this diagram, then. Let's say you smile, they smile, right? Now, they smile creates an idiosyncratic experience for you, right? And they smile might reinforce of your smile. So that is, if I smile and they smile back, it's probably going to reinforce my decision to smile in the future. And remember, that could be a non-conscious decision as well. But idiosyncratic experience, right, might shape the level of that reinforcement. 
is this a good thing or a bad thing necessarily? And then what do we have as our, as our last ellipse there? Activation and a, a physiological and neurological components of joy. So when is emotion occurring? Uh, well, according to Tom, because emotion is a result of this process. So it doesn't come first, it's a result of the affect system. So here we have stream of affect, affect fluctuates, so I smile, they smile back, affect, let's say, increases, right? And maybe when they smiled, the reason I smiled is because I had a relatively strong affiliation drive that I want to be around people and I want to have pleasant experiences with people. So there's the drive component. The affective component is it increases, okay? And now idiosyncratic experience is brought into it and through those pieces, this increase in affect, the resulting reduction in drive for affiliation because it's being successful, right? makes the smile reinforcing because it satisfied the drive and then we say, oh God, I'm happy. Right? The, the, then eventually the experience of joy comes along. And this is kind of where my thinking starts to, to, to kind of coalesce in, in thinking about emotion so often and its relationship to affect. But the affective stream is what's responding to the environment. The emotion is it possible that the emotion is just simply a label, an explanation that I apply to the change in the affect because I want to understand what this change in affect is? So then, let's take the structure. What choices do I have in labeling this variance in the affect? Well, the choices I have of emotion are structurally provided for me. They're based on the structure in which I'm embedded. So if you want to... <laughs> Do some, some heavyweight reading. Here's just some examples uh, of Tompkins' books. So, affect, imagery, and consciousness. You can see where all that is coming together. Kind of this intersection of, of all those points, right? And then you can, if that's not enough for you, volume one, you can buy the complete edition, right? And, and you can see it's a, it's a two-volume work. So, uh, if that's what you're looking for, good to go. I'm gonna I'm gonna stop now. There's a Zoom meeting uh, out, out on the horizon here, so I'll get back to this after that Zoom meeting. Uh, we're about halfway through, give or take, maybe a little more than that. We're gonna uh, look at Deloitte's here in, in, in a minute uh, and his explanation of affect. So that's coming up. So here we are finishing up part two of uh, module nine, if you will. Uh, so we're closing out the course. And uh, I'm glad that we had Penelope's help in, in, in doing this today. Uh, I don't think we could have done it without her. What do you think? All right. See you in a bit.